at Macmillan Learning Content Matters, and no Macmillan author exemplifies that more than Dave Myers, the world's best-selling psychology textbook author. From his engaging talk psych blog to the meticulous updating process he follows edition after edition. Myers is the master at making psychological science relevant and accessible. And when it comes to addressing vital issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and reaching out to students of all backgrounds, he is truly a groundbreaker. Macmillan Learning Psychology, where content matters, especially when authors like Dave Myers connect that content to the real lives of all kinds of students. To find out more, please visit macmillanlearning.com backslash psych sessions. Hello, and welcome to Psych Sessions, conversations about teaching and stuff. I'm Eric Landrum, along with Garth Neufeld, your podcast hosts. As the name implies, we center on conversations about teaching, but we often veer into other interesting topics, which is the end stuff. This is episode number 121, where Garth had the opportunity to interview John Dunlowski from Kent State University in Kent, Ohio. Before you hear the interview, please allow me to share some listening tips and some of my favorite moments. Now, this was a real treat to hear Garth have a chance to interview John. I don't know John very well. I've met him a couple of times at Midwestern Psychological Association meetings in Chicago, and John talks very fondly about MPA towards the very end of this interview. But all of my interactions with John have always been delightful and pleasant. I I like one of the opening quotes that John starts with at the very beginning, um, Garth's asking about, uh, well, I suppose you get um, asked to speak often and, you know, uh, be interviewed a lot. And John doesn't really know how to answer that. And John says, uh, and it, it sounds like a throwaway, but it's really it's this is delightfully clever. I don't really know if I get asked a lot uh, compared to others. Life is a within subject design. And just just cherish that one because that is just amazing Uh, john is such a deep thinker and he's thinking a lot about uh, not only cognitive psychology from a metacognition perspective but also about how the science of psychology can help our students not only k-12 but our college students uh, learn and navigate the world of knowledge and education and skills. And I really love um, his collaborative spirit as well as his applied focus. As And in addition to his um, top-notch basic cognitive skills in the laboratory as well. Uh, one of the things that you, you see over and over again across um, episodes, if you're a regular Psych Sessions listener, is that uh, John was able to co-author a book called Metacognition with Janet Metcalf. And then after that book comes out, other people notice it, like Roddy Rodiger, and that leads to other opportunities. And I think that's a really common theme, that once one accomplishment happens, other people in the sphere will um, notice that. And, and that's something that we've heard from other guests as well. One of the um, key um, summaries of the outcomes the, of John's work and the work of others in the area of, uh, meta, of metacognition and what works for students, uh, it'll be available as a link in the show notes here. Uh, the title of it, when you see it, will be Strengthening the Student Toolbox, Study Strategies to Boost Learning. And this is a publication that was made available in the American Educator in the fall of 2013. But it's a really nice summary of what works, what doesn't, and what might be preferred strategies. And this is kind of a public, uh, uh, publicly available summary of some things that are in the literature that have been authored by John and others. I do like that John mentions his own teaching, his undergraduate psycho- cognitive psychology course that he teaches at Kent State, and and how he approaches implementing teaching, you know, spaced practice and distributed learning, uh, and what a phrase that he likes to use, uh, transforming the dysregulated student uh, in his own undergraduate classroom. Uh, I so I, I liked hearing. Um, his own strategies as the expert cognitive psychologist. 
when Garth asked him about, uh, you know, professionally, where do you hang out? Who's your tribe? Um, John said, well, psychonomics is my tribe. Uh, and I'd never heard this phrase, but he called himself a psychonome. And so I really appreciated that. Um, his work actually started uh, as a gerontologist, and that's what his specialty was. And his work on memory to help older people uh, improve their memory skills shifted then to help younger people improve their memory skills. And so I appreciated that context. Uh, John was also really, uh, was really honest in sharing that uh, his own imposter syndrome story of as a graduate student at uh, UW in Seattle, um, being at that poster session and having no one come up and talk to you because you were in an area that I, from his story at the time, no one really seemed interested in. And that, um, after, you know, the popularity of metacognition caught on, uh, he calls it that, uh, that part of the success of his career was accidental. Um, I'm a little disappointed that Garth didn't push back on that, but he was kind of running out of time during his scheduled interview. So uh, I appreciate the humility that John displayed. But trust me, the little I know about John, he's an incredibly hard worker, and I don't think any of it was accidental. I understand good fortune, but I don't think it was accidental, and it certainly wasn't luck. Let's be careful with that. Um, I appreciated uh, John and Garth during this interview, and I think you'll enjoy it as much as I did. Welcome to the program. Uh, this is Garth, and I am here today with John Dunlowski from uh, Kent State University. And uh, John, you just told me that's in Kent, Ohio, and it's outside of Cleveland. How did I do? You did just great. <laughs> Love right. It. And uh, we are doing this on Zoom right now. So we're we're actually meeting for the first time. Uh, and I appreciate you uh, taking the time to do this. I noticed you have a nice wine rack behind you, too, which I'm intrigued about. So, <laughs> yeah, first, it's my pleasure to be here. And the wine rack is actually all of these bottles are filled with with water or something. It just looks good, but uh, nothing really that's too drinkable here. <laughs> good stuff's in the basement. Oh, good, good. Well, I uh, I have a virtual background, so you won't see you won't see my house right now. But um, <laughs> um, hey, I really again I want to say thanks for coming. I I, I understand that uh, you uh, are probably you probably get a lot of invitations to speak. Is is that fair to say? Well, it's hard to know what a lot is when, given that life is a within subject design. I'm not sure that often the people I talk to get more than I do. So I, I tend to think I don't get uh, invited too much, but I certainly enjoy uh, discussing what I do and discussing uh, student achievement and scholarships. So, yeah, yeah cool. Well, I, I'm, I have been uh, a long, long admirer of your work, uh, particularly um, the the very well known um, article that you wrote. I think in 2013, the improving students' learning with effective learning techniques, and then um, and then the PDF. I think was just a fantastic idea. I don't know where that came from, but the what works, what doesn't PDF is is so accessible uh, for for faculty and students. Um, how did that come about, that what works, what doesn't? Uh, what works, what doesn't? Now, are you referring to the Scientific Mind article or for the American Educator spin -off? Oh, I don't know. Um, let That's me, okay. Let I, me I, see I can... what I'm looking for uh, or what I'm talking about. <laughs> I, am, I am looking at the, uh, it's a multicolored, Ooh. oh, let's, you know what? Hey, we're on Zoom. Nobody else will be able to see it, but we will. So let me show you. That's what I'm looking Love at. It. How's that? Awesome. Okay. Did you that, know that they did this? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Although this, you know, the publishing world is, you know, sometimes there's a big curtain over it for us all. So for a while, uh, Scientific American, uh, Scientific Mind rather, uh, had a, a deal going with PSPI where I published the monograph. And almost every monograph that came out in PSPI had a another article written for it in this particular venue. Um, and they stopped doing that a while ago, but they thought this particular spin or focus on student achievement might really be a good issue. And for that particular uh, article, which I do love, they wrote it all. I mean, my name's on it. I felt pretty uncomfortable about that because, Whoa. yeah, right. So they took, I worked with one of their editors. Uh, they told me that this is just how they do business and that I was welcome to read 
of what they had done. Uh, and they did a great job kind of summarizing what I, uh, what uh, my, my colleagues and I did in the uh, PSPI monograph. Even better, though, my favorite spinoff is from the American Educator, and they let me write that one. Thank goodness. Oh, okay. And it's a lot of fun. I get to joke in it and uh, talk directly, in this case, to teachers. And I think that one actually is, believe it or not, pretty popular in Europe right now. So I get do get a lot of calls on that. Spin you, because um, is, that, uh, is that freely accessible? Is, um... It should be, but I can definitely share it with you, Garth, if you have a place to uh, share it with others. But Yeah, you know, we can put it into the notes so people can see it. Because I got to tell you, I've never... For whatever reason, maybe I just never noticed it, but I've never come across that one. Yeah. And it, again, it's just another spin off the uh, 2013 monograph. So the yeah. same content is there. It just, I think it's uh, one of the most accessible versions of that content because as much as uh, I really appreciated the scholarship that uh, my colleagues and I put into that 2013 monograph, and I've at least had some people tell me it was enjoyable to read, I don't kind of believe those <laughs> folks. <laughs> <laughs> because it's dry. It's like just all data. Like, here's our assessment. You got to be really dedicated to work through the uh, monograph. But the spinoffs say the same thing. And again, the one in American Educator, I think is really accessible for teachers. Awesome. Yeah. Well, and I'll tell you, I, I used the monograph um, uh, for a faculty uh, kind of reading conversation uh, this uh, last term, and uh, and and we were all well. I wasn't, but people were surprised by the fifty pages or whatever it was. <laughs> um, but but it was it was a wonderful. There like there was just so much that came out of that. And so if people don't know your work or or don't know about the uh, uh, PSPI uh, article, can you just can we start there? I'm, I'm interested in many other things. I think that you're, that, and, and probably you've moved on since 2013, I imagine. Yeah, but we, we all move pretty slowly in this world. So, <laughs> uh, but maybe could you just tell us where did that come from? Um, like how did that article come to be written? Mm -hmm. And, um, and maybe we'll, let, let's just start there. Okay. Um, a great question, actually, a fun one too. So, several years before this article kind of, developed the idea to write this article, I got involved with a larger research group uh, that's funded by uh, the James McDonald Foundation. And in the group, we did as collectively as a group, collaborated and did our independent research together, our independent research. And it was kind of boring psychonomic stuff. You get together and you talk about research and so forth. Very kind of a let's collect data in the laboratory and see what works. At the same time, I had just finished a book with Janet Metcalf calf called metacognition. Now there's fine. It's a textbook. It's kind of dry. It's, I love that it's kind of uh, really kind of ended a era of research for me to write that textbook, but it took a long time. It was a lot of effort for anyone who's written something like this. You know, it just takes discipline and you got to stick to it. Okay. Well, Roddy, who was part of that larger ACPEAK group, noticed that I just wrote this book and thought, wow, someone really needs to overview what works best with respect to the learning strategies that were kind of of interest to this research group. And Roddy just happened to have the ear of the folks who kind of are in charge of the monograph and who make invitations because they're looking to invite people to write these things. But as you can imagine, if you have a topic you really want someone to write a monograph for, you got to be pretty sure that they're going to deliver because it could take years to write that. So if at the end they don't deliver, then you've got kind of a blank space, something that you were expecting. And quite frankly, uh, and, and I think this is positive, Roddy in explaining why I could do this said, well, the guy obviously could write a lot of words, kind of like, yeah, he's gonna just get the job done. Don't get me wrong. It's also something I was really interested in at the time. So it was like perfect alignment. It's like I had the energy to write, really wanted to do the scholarship with respect to reviewing all the relevant literature. And most important, I was surrounded by colleagues who I knew would step up and help out because uh, really there are many authors on that monograph and everyone did their fair share, especially Catherine Ross and, and Elizabeth Marsh, who really uh, pulled heavy weight to do all the scholarship in it. So it kind of came to pass like that. It still took us three years to do the scholarship and to write it and rewrite it and rewrite it. Wow. So, yeah. Well, yeah, and, and be, the the metacognition book came out in 2008 if i mm -hmm. 
did my math right. And this came out in 2013. So when you said, yeah, they had seen this, this, I, I don't know if you said new book, but they had seen this new book that I put out. So there was quite a time in between, even though mm-hmm. this was probably in process, what, like 2010 or something. Absolutely. Well, uh, probably uh, the idea was 2009. Roddy approached us. Everyone gets enthusiastic. You find your collaborators are going to help out. You develop a game plan. And then nothing happens for a year. Yeah. And then the publisher writes, it's like, hey, have you guys been working on this? And then things really start to fall into place. But yeah, it was kind of a major accomplishment, a really fun project. I really, quite frankly, learned a lot with respect to both communication, doing these large reviews, and just trying to understand how to do a qualitative review in a way where we could provide relatively confident recommendations for teachers and how they can apply this work, which is something we're all really concerned about, right? Not going beyond our data, not making recommendations that we're not confident in, but yet not wanting to hold back. So that was a major challenge. And and quite frankly, some of the first versions of the monograph uh, were some of my favorite where our recommendations really got nuanced. And folks Uh. who (laughs) <laughs> folks who read this to review it said, you know, maybe this is a little bit too nuanced uh, with respect to recommendations because I felt <laughs> kind of put that in context. Some of those strategies that we gave low ratings to, yeah, they work in the right context. So it hurt me to give them low ratings, knowing that, well, when used just in the right way, they could be pretty effective. But remember, the goal of that monograph was to discover what kind of strategies are going to work for lots of different people across lots of different contexts, not really task-specific. So that kind of hurt, but at least that I understood that, right? I could very make that explicit in the monograph. A couple of the other strategies, though, we kind of gave middle to low ratings when we knew the evidence just wasn't available Yep. But yet, what we saw and our understanding of how the mind works suggested these are going to be winners, but we just need more evidence. For instance, uh, interleaved practice for solving math problems. There's been a lot of evidence that came out since 2013 that suggests at least within this large domain of learning mathematics, <clears throat> interleaving is a really great strategy. And I, if I could write, rewrite it over now, that one would probably get a high rating up there. From what we've learned. So I think all of these categories are malleable. So some that are low could move up, some that are high could move down, all at least for right now over the past six years. Except for that one rating, pretty much everything is stable. We still feel pretty does pretty good about what our recommendations were then. Does a oh, I've got a thousand questions, but does a piece of work like this um should it be redone in 10 years? You know, should it be as we get more research? Because I suspect that that article actually spurred on a whole lot of research in these areas, right? I hope so. I, yeah. You know, we we believe it has. Yeah, you know what? I think we should revisit it, whether it's us or someone else, like yeah. 10 years later, what's the evidence? Yeah. And it wouldn't by any means need to be a lengthy um, a document. You'd have to do a lot of scholarship because some of these um, – <clears throat> particular strategies that we reviewed, I know there's not been a lot happening in the last six years, where others, there have been so much happening. And I think part of the review could be not only that, yeah, what's happened in the past 10 years largely confirms our original recommendations, but I think that's where now you can get into nuances. Like, not only do we know this works, we really know how best to actualize the benefits of this strategy like testing, for instance, or or, our retrieval practice, where we could add to the recommendations on how to use it in the best way. So I'd love to see a a redo of that or an expansion of that to more strategies and so forth. And um, Well, it was really really clear in the mid-level or low-level ones that there were times where – it, it was just clear that we don't have enough. We, we don't have enough research on this to make it a whatever. I think that other article called it a gold star recommendation, right? Which is yeah. sticky. But um, yeah, but uh, yeah. And so, so that was really clear, but I would, I would love to see that. You know, what's really cool, uh, John, is that people have just run with this stuff. It's so pervasive now. Uh, do you think that it was the work of your group that was, and you know, 
feel free to to say yes or no. But uh, is is was it the work of your group that really made this brought this into the kind of the consciousness of teaching of psychology? I, I you know, uh, I think we were just one little drop with many other raindrops kind of converging on the same conclusion about what could work best. So no, I don't think our monograph was essential. I think without the monograph, we go in the same direction. I think it just helped move everything along. For instance, Hal Paschler had written a beautiful Institute of Education Science um, best practices guide. If you go back and check it out, I mean, they make a lot of the same recommendations. Their overlap in the reviews are kind of the same. Okay. So why didn't, again, that monograph also had a big splash. So I think it's all of these together kind of coming out at the same time, largely uh, arriving at the same kinds of conclusions, right? Yeah. With the backdrop at the time being the replication crisis. So this kind of what really is robust, I think was natural kind of when it came out, people were ready to hear this kind of thing. They saw the value in, let's really do a, a closer look to see which recommendations really stand up to the evidence that are going to be robust recommendations. So I think it was timing. I, I don't want to give us, I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm really proud of the work and I'm just really happy how it's been received. Mm -hmm. But I think part of the, the, uh, the wave of change, so to speak, with respect to using some of these simple strategies was a great collective effort uh, sure. among quite a few educational psychologists, cognitive psychologists, and from what I'm seeing now, outrageously motivated teachers who are looking for ways to improve their instruction and who are finding at least some um, positives in this work. They're seeing, like, I'm assuming the, the needle move with respect to their students' achievement when they use these strategies. So, yeah, yeah I, think I think it's pretty positive. Where, wherever, you know, obviously my point of connection with it was was through through that monograph and um and that work um and then now i've seen like this these waves come afterwards books written by people who are like really running with these ideas i don't know that some of those books get the traction that they get without that first wave and and maybe that wasn't the first wave maybe there was a wave before that as well but but without that wave i'm not sure how this gets into like into teachers uh hands really um or into their their courses and so um why do you think it resonated so much with with us now like as teachers you know, of psychology you know and i think there we've got kind of two groups here we're talking about teachers like us of psychology and why this made a big splash? You know, that's a great question. I'd love to know. It's kind of a historical kind of like, why did everyone gravitate toward this? Part of it's just going to be incredible advertising, I think, by the APS and getting their product out there, which is a great thing. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you for K through 12, where this has had a major splash, it was this wonderful spinoff articles like you showed me originally from... Uh, uh, scientific mind and from the edu uh, American educator that when they were getting done, I enjoyed writing them or at least helping to write them. But I thought they would not be that would not have such a big impact, partly because I'm a run of the mill uh, researcher who sees impact with respect to publishing kind of boring cognitive studies and then maybe having two people cite those studies. And I feel like I've had a great couple of years or something. <laughs> yes. So, and then when the American educator, you know, hits 600,000 teachers, I mean, right there, you, you see that small little ripple turn into a, to a major wave. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and note that some of these ideas, Garth, really aren't that difficult to instantiate in the classroom. Yep. So it's, it's not only do some of these strategies can have a good benefit on the students, but you don't have to put a lot of effort into instantiating them well in the classroom. And I don't want to say, oh my goodness, teachers don't want to use effort. Just not just the opposite. Teachers are using so much effort to do so many other things, to coordinate their classrooms, to do good teaching. Oh, isn't it nice every once in a while that you give a little gift back where, hey, use this strategy like retrieval practice 
benefit your students with respect to the long-term retention of the content and help you figure out like through formative evaluation what they're not getting in class so you can kind of react. So I think all these things kind of combine to really make uh, what really has been kind of a minor little revolution with respect to using these strategies in the classroom. Yeah. I, I wonder if this kind of gift the gift of this knowledge has sat with cognitive and an educational psychologist for a long time. And then the rest of us who uh, many of us don't have any training teaching um, or yeah, to, to teach formally <laughs> yeah. at least. Right. And, but maybe this is just what we were looking for. This is like, for me, this was a missing piece of what I was looking for. I wanted to have an evidence-based course I wanted to make sure that I had reasons for the things that I was doing in my courses. And when I came upon this work, I thought, first of all, um, it's not overwhelming. Uh, when I when I read these things, they make sense, especially if I had seen a talk on it where somebody talked about implementing retrieval practice, implementing distributed practice, um, and, and they showed me how you could do it so simply. And I got to say that the feeling of being an evidence-based instructor and making those decisions, it made me feel like, um, like I wasn't an imposter anymore as an educator. Does that resonate? Does that make sense? It, it, it resonates. And in some ways, for some of the best techniques were liberating for me because yeah. you know, I've discovered this along with everyone else, right? So I think one of the best general techniques is something called successive relearning, which is just simply a combination of retrieval practice and space practice done in, a, in the right way. And getting students to use this is pretty straightforward. Doing this in the classroom is pretty straightforward, but it takes time. Okay. It's a simple strategy, but it takes effort to use. The strategy itself we know can lead to very long-term retention. Why is it liberating? Because there's no way a student who isn't studying around the clock can use this kind of strategy for all the content they're learning, okay? So this strategy is meant for really mastering material that's critical for them to learn and retain beyond, say, a one-semester course. And the liberation was, oh my goodness, I'm teaching them too much. I have to make better decisions as a instructor about what my real learning objective is for a certain week or two and what I want them to retain and take away with them after my class. And as a cognitive psychologist, I think I have a lot of good stories and content and knowledge to share and discuss with my students, but it made me realize, well, maybe not all of it's created equal. Some of it may be more important. So the strategies have allowed me to really whittle down my content with a less is more kind of attitude because I feel like I can really help those students learn and understand the less using the right techniques, right? We'll take them more time, but now there's a fighting chance they'll retain some of this content for higher level courses to use later in life. So for me, it was liberating and it was an eye opener because I was your standard I hope entertaining, but yet kind of standard lecture. Yeah. And it's not that I would provide content I didn't think the students shouldn't have, but I was just doing way too much and hence not allowing the students to have enough time to really master any of it. So part of at least teaching early on in my career, I felt like I was putting my students kind of at a deficit by expecting too much. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, and the strategies made me realize, oh my goodness, best case scenario, they just can't learn at all, right? Yeah. Uh, Less what, is more. What, what courses do you tend to teach with some regularity? Because you're, uh, you also are, you guys have a great name for it, but I can't remember what it is. The Teaching and Learning Center. What do you call it? Scientific? No. <laughs> oh, no. We have a Teaching and Learning Center, certainly, that's yeah. focused on... Uh, basically uh, instructors at Kent State wanting to get practice and learning more about uh, how to uh, teach like an expert. I'm a co-director of the Science of Learning and Education Center. And what that position allows me to do is to work with faculty who want to evaluate whether some techniques they've developed might work in their own classroom. So I help them develop, I'm hoping, high quality classroom research to evaluate whether your new technique or even a technique that you're modifying for your class works 
And I'm also asked to write a lot of grants with people. So this is kind of more of an administrative role for like, hey, John, help people out here. But by far, uh, the most fun I have is designing classroom experiments so we can explore how these techniques work for particular learning objectives, explore new techniques and so forth. So it's just a blast. I get to to kind of join my love of doing science with my love of teaching all at once. Yeah. That's really cool. And do those uh, end up, some of those get published? Some of you know, uh, you know what, this is, <laughs> that's a great question. They, they fall in two camps. Sometimes the things that the teachers come up with that they want to evaluate as a cognitive psychologist, I kind of know that, okay, this is not going to work. Right. But they have to do it and see it on their own. Typically because there's not a principled reason why it would work when it doesn't work, it's really not news, right? So yep. it's hard to get that kind of thing published. Uh, but I've worked with other, uh, other contexts with other teachers where, yeah, we uh, get the research uh, published. We're working on a really cool project right now where we're looking at um, kind of a, a queuing or bolding of content within question prompts to help students who aren't careful readers out. Because sometimes, you know, you're asking a student about why they're missing all these multiple choice questions that are conceptual, right? And you get the hint that it's like, oh my goodness, they do understand the question, but they didn't read it carefully. Don't get me wrong. There's something to be said about reading carefully and understanding what a question is asking. But you also want to really try to understand what the students understand. And if part of the issue is that they aren't interpreting a question right, that's really not ideal. So we're playing around with different question formats, again, in a classroom setting, big uh, intro to psych class, just to evaluate what, what works best. So it's a lot of fun. Some of the stuff does go and get published. Some of it, you know, we do follow-ups, you know, research just takes a lot of time. So. Right. So um, are you, is that, is that a full-time gig doing that co-directing um, there or, or are you, are you also teaching right now? It's a co-director by name only. It's, ah, it's, a, it's a web page. Okay. Uh, we had resources. It's very uh, official. <laughs> it, it was great. In fact, it, it is very useful, right? Because we are kind of a, a small little center. We, you know, we go after grants occasionally to support ourselves. Uh, but we're largely the uh, Brad Morris, who's the co-director from Ed Psych at Kent State. We're kind of on call to admin. So if they need... If there's something burning in the age education realm, we could be called to task to come help out type of thing. So yeah, it looks really official. It's a great little uh, center, but as uh, we like to joke, it's like, uh, Brad, it's the Brad Morris and John Domlowski center. Like <laughs> we're here to help you out uh, and we'll do the extra time. So yeah, I still have a regular teaching load and okay. research okay. load and stuff like that. Okay. And what, what courses are you uh, generally teaching? The, the actually at, at Kent state, unfortunately, Fortunately, the only one I teach regularly to undergraduates is a large uh, cognitive psychology class. And I say unfortunate, before I used to, I was a gerontologist and I, I love teaching psych of age and all this kind of thing, but it's no longer uh, something I'm asked to step up to do. So uh, once a year, I teach just a really large cog psych class. I love it. It's so <laughs> challenging. And uh, to see the students just really sit there listening to a cognitive psychologist and you can almost see the fear in their eyes because it's, they're not used to conceptual content, right. As, as sophomores. And it's just so fun to take them from, yeah, or I'm going to make you think deeply about this content and that's part of the class, but I'm going to help you do it successfully. And we just take our time and it just feels so great to see them like the, the light bulbs turning on in class and some of them getting the epiphany about how the mind works and how to understanding how the mind works can help you leverage success in life. Because no surprise, a lot of my cognitive psych course is aimed toward how to be a better student, how to be successful in life, right? How to use what we know about as, uh, from cognitive psychology to really help yourself out. Because at Kent State, most of the students that I get are not interested in going to grad school in cognitive psychology. If anything, they want to be uh, in social work or clinical or something like that. So, okay. So, 
I now take, because of uh, your work and some things that I've read, uh, I now take the first week of my course for sure, maybe a little bit more to teach and pretty much in all my courses, but I teach a lot of intro uh, psych. So uh, I take that time to really help students to understand um, um, how to study, uh, how we learn best. I mean, really what uh, the work that you've done, some of the work that, that Steve Chu's done on that. And, um, and so here, here's a question for you. Is it two questions developmentally? I teach, uh, freshman, sophomore, obviously. So, um, developmentally, when should we stop doing this with students? <laughs> um, maybe that's not the question, but is there a developmental consideration to when we introduce these things? And then how explicit does it have to be? Uh, like, should I talk about retrieval practice and distributed practice and make sure students understand so that they have the skills now to structure, to, to know that they can bring that out into their other classes or and or um, should I can I just implement it in my course? Like you talked about successive relearning. Can I just Im can I just structure my course in such a way that there is built in distributed practice? There's built in retrieval practice. Um, how would you recommend that folks do this in a way that's going to be best for students? First, I wish I had evidence based answers to all of this. But OK. That's what's going to be coming around the pike, right? Because of this new wave and the kinds of questions you're asking. Okay. Um, with that said, I would say yes to all these things. First, yeah. I implement these things in my class without, well, I was going to say without even telling my students, but I do actually tell them why I'm implementing them. Okay. I do a bit of training and what I teach this course this next year, uh, I'm actually going to give them um, credit toward the class to actually use a strategy in another course so they can hopefully see the benefits in a different course and talk to them about how they could do that. With that said, and this might seem evil spirited, I tend not to start the explicit discussion of strategies and a discussion of what I'm doing in class to help them prepare until after the first exam. Yeah. Now, what does that mean? Uh, some students are going to do poorly when maybe I could have helped them out beforehand. Although I'm not so sure you listen to a message prior to your first failure. Okay. That's just a total hypothesis, right? Yeah. I also set up the class so that you can do poorly on the first exam. So I let them know, let's not worry about this. The first exam is the first one. You're going to get used to how I ask questions. They know it's a multiple choice. Most of them are thinking, oh, multiple choice. I just have to recognize the answer. Well, Good luck with that, right? Because they're all conceptual questions. But then right after that first exam, I go, that's when I start doing the instruction about how to improve your memory. You know, do things like I'll dissect a multiple choice problem and help them understand for each one why they're so difficult and how they can attack it, right? So how, you know, often in cognitive psych, you, you don't, there's not one answer like, what does this theory say? It's, what does this theory say? But beware, you can confuse it with this other theory. So they don't know the theories well enough to begin with. So they get confused at the point of attack. And I can explain this really well after they've struggled, right? And then the next layer of, of kind of instruction explains how the strategies I'm teaching them to use can help them overcome these obstacles. Okay. Little things like too, one that I love, and I, I'd love to see more research on this too. Maybe we can collaborate, Garth, and, and do some cool stuff. I always tell my students that when they're doing multiple choice, and, and please just not only in my class and all your classes, do not look at the answers. Generate your answer first, then look at your answers. Okay. And I explain why this could be helpful and what they should be doing. And when we do practice tests at the beginning of each class, in my course, I start with the warm-up questions, right? No surprise. That's how I do it. I show them the prompt first, have them answer. Then I give them the, you know, multiple chase answers, have them answer. And then it goes to discussion from that point. Hopefully, all of this is helping them understand what I'm doing in the classroom and why it can help. And hopefully, some of these strategies they're taking from my class and employing it in other classes. But I think the word hopefully 
is not being actualized. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's very difficult to train for transfer. You know, I think we need to do it more explicitly. So you asked developmentally, when should we stop? How about when students do this on their own, which is for many of them, we shouldn't stop, right? Because they've not had any formal training in K to 12. Um, and the question is, who should we give this content to? I mean, as I'm right now teaching a graduate seminar on education and cognition and how to conduct classroom research. And one thing I have to remind my grad students occasionally is that, you know, 30% of the students really do well without our help. So let's not forget that we have a lot of really awesome students. Sometimes as educators, we're focused so much on the negative and how much we could do to help students. We forget that lots of students are achieving well. And I think that's, they are excelling. The question is, how do we bootstrap the other students up? And, you know, it certainly is going to take a lot more than retrieval practice training. Uh, and, but I'm almost certain it will involve some explicit training and buy-in from those students who are doing poorly. In fact, I just love a recent paper that came out by Mark McDaniel and Gil Einstein. I highly recommend uh, you, you check it out. And it's Perspectives in Psychological Science. No. So, oh, he's good. Yes, it is. And he talks about all the components that need to be in place for students to really embrace the use of an effective strategy. His model is promissory in the sense that this is what we think you need to do to really get a student to embrace a strategy and to transfer it to other contexts. But yet we're not sure. In other words, research isn't there. Things like you have, and the first is obvious, the students have to know about the strategy, okay? Well, I tell lots of students about the effectiveness of retrieval practice, how it works for all students. And many times I'll get from a, a response from a student, it's like, oh, I get it, John. That does work for everybody else, but not for me, right? Great. So knowledge isn't critical. Well, then they have to have the belief that that strategy is going to work for them, right? So that's good. Well, how do you make them embrace that belief? Probably experience success in multiple different venues, right? Well, then they have to have some commitment to their learning objective and to the strategy use, right? And so on and so forth. So it's like there's probably many different things that we're going to need to do to not only help students build a toolbox of strategies that are going to help them navigate not only college, but beyond college, right? But probably a lot of beliefs, commitment, motivation to, to really energize them to open up that toolbox, right? To use it when they need it versus just kind of going along the normal paces, which we know for many students is cramming the night before, right? Just trying to get by. And certainly when I was a younger teacher, that kind of upset me a little when you're just trying to get by anymore. I totally get it. You know, yeah. some classes that's fine if they're getting by, but I do know for most students, there are courses that they really want to excel in. And it's then they need to pick up that toolbox, right. And just not rely on their tried and true getting by strategies, right. They have to up the A game. And it's, it's like, I would love to know what the magic bullets are on transforming a somewhat dysregulated student into a student who really is going to use their toolbox in the right way. And I think Mark and Gil have provided some really nice insights in how that can be done. And again, it's going to be a lot more than just this one group of strategies. You know, we're going to go have to go well beyond that to really get students firing, uh, you know, on all cylinders, so to speak. Well, it makes me think about the, the fact that you said that this, um, that your your work has gone into elementary schools or high schools, but is it both? Actually right now, I, again, I'm, this is anecdotal because these are teachers I've been talking to in the UK and the States, uh, yeah. at least in the UK and some it's K through 12. Yeah. Especially retrieval practice is just pretty yeah. straightforward yeah. usage. So I think that's can be uh, leveraged in almost any level. Well, and well, and then so let's let's say that this is working its way over the next decade or whatever. This is working its way. Um, I've got an eight-year-old. If this works its way into her education experience by the time she gets to college, um, 
this isn't going to be new for her. Um, she will have either she will have some explicit knowledge of what she's been doing, or she will have the experience of doing it. Um, but right now, I feel like we're in this weird kind of maybe liminal space where uh, students, nobody ever told them how to study well because right. teachers didn't know how to study well. We all just did whatever we saw other people do or whatever somebody told us, which was not evidence-based. Um, so it, it seems to me like the students now versus students a decade from now could be could be different. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, fingers <laughs> crossed. Yes. We're going to cross our fingers and hope that happens. You know, I think... <sighs> It's going to be fun to watch how this progresses. Um, and I love your optimism. Shall I rain down with a little pessimism? Yeah, let's, let's go for it. Okay. <clears throat> so some of the, uh, I would say the most effective strategies that we're talking about, right? Because again, there's strategies outside the monograph that students would need to use to really be successful and all this kind of stuff. Let's take something like space practice. Outrageously effective. The good news is that all our students use it a lot in everything other than education, okay? So you could ask your students like, hey, um, what are you good at? Almost all of them raise their hand that they're good at something, whether it's um, video games, uh, dancing, some musical instrument. You start talking to them about how they got good, and they will tell you they won't say, hey, I use successive relearning or I use retrieval practice. But when they describe what they're doing, that's exactly how they get there, right? So there's some translational issue that's going on. Not It you know, works in all these other arenas, but not for education. So this is the pessimism. To use something like space practice, well, you naturally do it when you're really excited. You can't wait to get home to do that dance step again, right? Or that play your instrument or what have you. If you're not so excited about it, like it's for a class grade on a course that it's not passionate about. You don't go back to the dorm every night and pick up that book and practice, right? It doesn't even make sense to do that, okay? So in order to utilize the strategy, students need really good time management skills and discipline. Um, I do not have children. I do not know how K through 12 has changed dramatically since I was there. But I can tell you, I didn't need any time management skills to do well in K through 12. In fact, it seemed to me that pretty much every moment of my life was managed for me. So these strategies are great, but they kind of presuppose a student with other really important life skills. So when I'm asked, like, well, what, what all these strategies would you train students to use? It's almost a shock sometimes when I ask that because the first thing I'll say is time management. It's like, what? That's not even here. Yet I'll have students, and this should make you laugh or sad. I'll have some students say, well, time management. Yeah, I'm more free and easy. I just take things as they come. <laughs> and I do like that attitude in some aspects of life. I think you should be able to turn that, let's take it as it comes, switch on. Mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't always keep it on, though, right? If you want to really be successful in the long run, because uh, at some point, you need to manage your time. So that's the pessimism. If at the same time, we're training students to manage their time and expecting them to do that, K through 12, Yeah. well, maybe now we'll have it, all the planets will align and and education will be transformed. But Yeah. And I think the question is who, again, who is teaching them um, the benefit of of, of good time management. Um, if we weren't told, if our, this generation of educators wasn't told of how important it is. Now, probably many of us figured that out at some point, <laughs> but we hope that, uh, I, I would hope that those who, if we value that, that those who we are teaching would get it before we did, because nobody sat me down and said, now I'm going to teach you to manage your time. You know, I had to, um, I had to get myself into trouble in order to, you know, to do that. <laughs> so, well, if it happens, it happens, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, so is this where you, where, where, where was John Donlowski before, before this article came out and there was, you know, and it created so much buzz. What were you, were you always just interested in these things or, you know, you talked about how this, this work kind of came out of a conversation and I'm going to guess that, um, 
that that's with some of your pals uh, through psychonomics. Is that seem to be your group? That's your group of people. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I'm a Are you president right now? I was chair a couple of years ago. Oh, I just recently st- stepped off the governing board. No, my heart is with psychodome, psychonomics. I'm yeah. a psychodome. <laughs> well, um, so were you all, is this just the kind of thing that you would talk about uh, prior to 2013? This is what cognitive psychologists talk about when they're hanging out? No, not at all. Uh-huh. No, especially it's psychonomics. Although we've had a revolution in the past 10 years where there's been more instructional research and uh, cognitive education at psychonomics. And if I had to put my finger on anybody who really made that change at this conference, it's Roddy Rodiger, Bob Bjork, and that those folks who said, no, this is important. Cognitive psychologists should have something to say about that. But no, this stuff doesn't bubble up at conferences at, at psychonomics t- typically, unless you're within your little in-group. Uh, you know, how I got into it um, was really, it, it seems like a long road, but it's pretty short. I was doing gerontology work and trying to understand why older adults have memory failures and trying to develop techniques to help them with these failures. Because I really wanted to kind of harness metacognition, which is my kind of my passion uh, doing metacognitive work in a way that could improve older adults' lives. Okay, it makes complete sense. And I was getting funded by National Institute on Aging. So my heart was there <laughs> uh, working with Chris Herzog. And we did this work for a long time, uh, for about, she's 12, 15 years. Um, I loved it. And then about halfway through a light bulb turned on and it was, I'm trying to help people who don't need my help. And in other words, many older adults have a suspicion that their memory is failing. And the suspicion is something that when they were younger and having memory failures, they would not have attributed to age. When in fact, their memory is just fine. Or you have some kind of uh, early onset neurological difficulties. Well, I'm not saying that uh, effective cognitive strategies can't be helpful, but you need more, right? It's just, this is, this is not going to be that beneficial. We just need a different direction. No doubt some of my collaborators back then might argue with me, right? What I did realize though, that all the work I'd been doing on metacognition and how to improve older adult learning was like, well, why can't this just be applied to students? It was an epiphany. And then you had the epiphany with not getting funded by the National Institute on Aging, which then allows an opportunity to shift focus. Once that happened, as much as you know, I hated stopping that collaborative work, I immediately shifted to doing education research. And that kind of aligned with me going to Kent State. It's like, okay, it's my, it's my chance. Even though, thank you, Kent State, they hired me as a gerontologist. They also turned a blind eye when I, I kind of shift, shifted directions and put all my efforts toward working with college students, K through 12 and stuff like that. You know, and maybe in your world that writing a book on metacognition in 2008 is um, maybe that was kind of a reasonable timeline for like that work on metacognition. But um, I'll, I'll tell you, there are many faculty members all over America right now who couldn't define metacognition for us. I've, I've run <laughs> into them. Um, I, you know, so I'm not going to throw anybody under, under the bus, but you know, it's 2020, 21 now. And, um, and so it's, it's just interesting to me how, um, how early you were on these waves because like, who was talking about metacognition when you wrote the book on it? <laughs> well, that, I don't want to give myself too much credit for that wave because that was really going strong. But I will admit as a graduate student, it was demoralizing because at something like psychonomics, I tell this to, to my grad students, so I get a little pity. It, you've been to two poster sessions before where no one's going to a poster. And when everyone walks by, they kind of look the other way. Yeah. I was a dude at that poster working on my little judgment of learning research that no one cared about because metacognition, what the world is that? It turns out, as you know, metacognition is nothing that mysterious or magical, right? It's pretty straightforward. Uh, But at the time, at least with respect to cognitive psychology, there were very few people doing metacognitive research. I mean, it was how I stuck with it or why I did without a group 
I have no idea why. You know, you find the one or two other folks who have been uh, maligned and, and kicked out of the group and you kind of hang with them during, you know, at the bar late at night or something like that. But uh, the good news is, though, my goodness, it took off. I feel like, you know, I went from like, no one wants to talk to me to, geez, everyone's now interested. So I, I will admit, part of my, if you can say success in my career has been accidental completely. I mean, I, I went to work with Tom Nelson, who was doing metacognitive research. You just do what your mentor's doing. I loved it. And it just, the accidental part, I just happened to be young enough. So I got in right when it was taking off, right? Uh, yeah. So I, I feel very fortunate. Yeah, that that's reason. fun. That's fun. Where where did you go to uh where did you go to grad school? I was at University of Washington in Seattle. Oh, that's where yeah. I am. <laughs> yeah. Wow. It's awesome. Oh wow, that's awesome. Okay, I didn't know that. Oh my goodness, how did I miss that? Oh, cool. Okay, and then uh an undergraduate? Undergraduate oh, uh Ohio Wesleyan uh and Wright State. I kind of bounced around. Oh man. What was your uh what was your program at uh at uw seattle was it cognitive psych actually this is a it was metacognitive psych my mentor at the time um tom nelson a major stature in the field but as you know sometimes departments they have falling outs among faculty and he, they had a falling out and he started his own area went to his own so when i got to university of washington i found out that I was in a department of one. That was me and my mentor. It was pretty uncomfortable, actually. But yeah, so I was kind of in the cognitive program. I, uh, but you know, uh, it's kind of weird, quite frankly. Yeah. And were were there many people out, like other than your mentor, who who were doing this work around the country? No, I mean, uh, certainly, thank goodness, people were paying attention to the work. Uh, Tom mm -hmm. and I wrote a paper, uh, one of my first actually, on something called the, the delayed judgment of learning effect. And one of the best things that happened in my career is that Bobby Spellman and Bob Bjork wrote basically a rebuttal to it, saying that, I mean, I'm going to paraphrase here, that what Tom and John discovered is just kind of an artifact. It's not that interesting. Or I think Bob would say it's interesting, but it's an interesting artifact. Totally fine. But by, of course, as you know, when someone like kind of attacks you and attacks the idea is not us, obviously, mm -hmm. it just draws more attention to the entire endeavor. And that I think really got a lot of people involved in doing this kind of research at Psychonomics because it provided a debate and the effect itself was really easy to demonstrate. So anyone could kind of play in the game. So it started to really uh, cascade at that point, like in the early 90s. Again, in cognitive psychology, metacognitive research uh, was much more front and center at, in education conferences. And so in education areas, it was kind of a slow comer to cognitive psychology. But yeah, yeah, interesting. Um, where are you? Like your affiliation, obviously, is with with psychonomics. That's that's who you spend a lot of time with. I know that you know our our mutual friend Marianne Lloyd through uh, psychonomics. Yeah, big thumbs up. Um, and uh, are you involved in other other like APS, APA, Society for Teaching of Psychology? Have you dipped your toes in any of those? I haven't, and but just personal reasons. I, I travel so much. I do get asked to give a lot of talks and, yeah. and I love visiting. I'm just kind of a social being, by the way, this pandemic has really not <laughs> been great for many people, including myself. So yeah. I travel so much that I just decided early on that I have to pick my battles. Yeah. And I felt like, okay, and, and you'll understand this, the folks that at least who continued on in academia that I went to grad school with that I kind of got became friends with early on, go to psychonomics. And you understand that you kind of go back for your people. Yeah. I pay attention what's going on in these other societies, but I have not uh, played an active role in APA or APS for quite some time, except for Midwestern psychological association, I think is just the cat's meow. One of the 
the best regional conferences in the States. So I, I attend whenever there's not a pandemic. Yeah, good. Well, I will, I'll be going to my first one, hopefully last or next year, last year I was supposed to go, but uh, yeah, we'll run into each other in person then. Hope so. um, yeah. 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 Well, that's, that's amazing. Um, well, and, and no pressure. I, I just was interested in, in kind of which, which other circles, if any, that you uh, sort of run in as people do in, in, in this sort of world, right? Absolutely. Um, yeah. Well, I, you know, a lot of times in this podcast, we go into um, folks' backstories. We kind of try to figure out, like, how did they get to this point? Unfortunately, I've kept you, I've, I've been so interested um, in kind of the last, you know, 10, 15 years of your, of your life and career that we haven't gotten to it too much. But um, that just gives me an excuse to reach out to you maybe uh, in, in a year or so and say, hey, you want to come back and talk some more? Um, so anyway, open invitation. You can take me up on it or not. I'd love to. It's been my pleasure to talk to you. This is just too much fun. What well, you're doing with the psych sessions is just great. Well, thank you. And, um, and you know, on behalf of so many teachers of psychology and hopefully getting outside of psychology and into other areas as well. Um, I just want to thank you and your group for uh, this great work, which has made our lives easier as we're trying to do um, evidence-based teaching um, and, and really better do the call of psychology to, um, to, to help make our students' lives better. Um, so anyway, thanks so much for, for your work. I really appreciate the discussion. It's been wonderful.